My name is Dave Whitlock. I've been a Civil War reenactor for 14 years. Today I'd like to give you some idea what it is like for a new reenactor to get involved in the Civil War hobby. Uh, the main emphasis that a new reenactor should, should have as he gets involved in the reenactment hobby is mainly to educate. Uh, but you always want to have fun getting involved in a new hobby or a new interest. But your main interest should be to go ahead and try to educate the general public of the customs and of the battles of the Civil War. Uh, the Civil War reenactor tries to give the general public an idea as he walks through the camp, uh, as he looks at a battle, what basically the common soldier was going through at that time. The last thing that the Civil War reenactor, of course, wants to do is to glorify war. But when you talk about heritage, when you talk about what the common soldier went through at that point in time, you are conveying a very important part of history uh, in American history. So uh, our main emphasis uh, in this, by doing Civil War reenactments is to educate, is to show people what the customs were about concerning camp life, dress of the soldier, what the battles were about, uh, how they maneuvered on the field, how they shot their musket. Uh, there were so many things about the Civil War that you can read in a history book. It's a visual means, a training aid by which the individual can just actually see before his eyes what actually happened on the battlefield. As I do uh, battle reenactments and living histories, I am amazed after reading an article in a book or in a magazine or seeing something on TV related to the Civil War, what the war was, by, by looking at that and by actually experiencing it on the battlefield, I am amazed at uh, how things are very similar. Sometimes you feel like you're going back in time and you're actually going through the motions that your my forefathers uh, forefathers of those other soldiers, reenactors on the battlefield, went through. That is one of the most rewarding things I think a new reenactor can go through as he gets involved in the hobby and has, as he gets more advanced in doing the drill and just showing the general public what the, what the Civil War was like. Uh, I get a lot of satisfaction from talking to different groups and having a lot of people ask questions related to the Civil War. And uh, you'll be surprised there, there's a lot of Civil War history out there and customs that people do not know about. So it's, it's a very rewarding thing for a reenactor to get involved in. There's a lot of self-satisfaction. And I'm sure uh, as a new reenactor gets involved in the hobby, he will, <clears throat> he will enjoy what he's doing from the standpoint of just being totally engrossed in it. And as time goes on and, he, and as he learns to drill and as he sees the people walk through the streets and handle the muskets and things of that sort, that uh, uh, he'll get a great deal of satisfaction by being in the Civil War hobby. My name is Paul Mayna. I'm an eight-year Civil War reenactor veteran. I'm also a Civil War living historian. I'm going to talk to you just a little bit of today as a new reenactor of what kind of events you will primarily be involved with. The events that I'm going to talk to you about today are the Living History event, the Civil War battle reenactment event, and as you progress in the hobby, and you begin to get a little more veteran status yourself, there will be times you'll be invited to do ceremonial events. Now, in a living history event, <clears throat> the whole idea of this is to spend the weekend living as much as possible like the Civil War soldier actually did. His camp life, his style of life, the hardships that he had to endure, and you will have the public generally coming through these living history events. They'll be asking you questions. You can answer the questions because your goal here is to teach these people what life was like 
for the soldier then. Not only do you teach them, but you have an opportunity to learn a little bit more about it yourself and you have the opportunity to experience it. Now, in a Civil War battle reenactment, it generally is a two-day event. The battle that takes place on Saturday is called a tactical. And the tactical is not for the public, it is strictly for the reenactors, although there may be some public around from time to time. The way a tactical is won is that the officers, through troop movements and troop maneuvers, it, that will decide the day as to who wins that tactical. It gives your officers a chance to operate independently, away from any kind of a script, and it shows whether, really whether they're capable or not. So that's the battle on Saturday. The Sunday battle is designed to choreograph history as much as possible, exactly like the original battle was fought. So whoever won the battle that you're doing on that particular event 125 or 30 years ago will win the battle on that Sunday as well. The battle reenactments themselves also include living history at the same time. Now, very rarely will a living history event include a battle. So you have two different types of events. Now, as I said earlier, as you go through uh, your reenactment career, your unit may be invited to do some ceremonial events. Ceremonial events could be things like uh, color guard, presenting the flags, uh, ceremonial events for Union and Confederate dead in cemeteries, ceremonial events dedicating monuments to uh, individuals in the Civil War. But these events generally will come later on as you become more accustomed to reenacting and you learn a little bit more about what's expected of you as a reenactor and what you're expected to know as a reenactor. So, <clears throat> Also, I want to mention now, when you do these events, there's two ways to do the events. You can either do it what is called first person, or you can do it in third person. To do an event in first person simply means that your speech, your mannerisms, your general lifestyle, as much as you can perfect it, is exactly like it would have been 130 years ago. For example, if you are doing an event that would represent an event of 1862, and somebody comes up to you and wants to talk to you about something in 1864, you really can't know anything about that because for you, 1864 hasn't happened yet. In third person, you talk to people just like you talk to your friends. Uh, if they want to discuss 1864, fine. You want to discuss 1862, fine. So there is a little more demand for knowledge from the reenactor when he does a first person impression. I'd like to talk to you about getting involved in a reenactment unit. Uh, there are basically three branches of the uh, Civil War unit. That is infantry, cavalry, and artillery. If you are interested in shooting a musket, in general camp life, and uh, maneuvering on the field in a battle, and learning drill, then infantry is the branch for you. If you enjoy working with horses, going through maneuvers on the battlefield with a horse, uh, having an engagement on the battlefield, doing reconnaissance, uh, then cavalry is for you. If you enjoy doing, uh, firing a cannon, uh, positioning a cannon in certain places on the battlefield, going through the drill, loading the cannon, then the, Sil then the Civil War artillery group is for you. Uh, all of these things uh, go into making up a Civil War reenactment, and I'm sure one of these branches would be ideal for your interest. Uh, there's also the civilian reenacting, re which uh, a lot of reenactors are doing these days, 
where you have a civilian flair uh, as far as uh, what the civilian would have uh, actually worn or what his customs would have been at that time. A lot of Civil War reenactors are branching out on that. So that is definitely another area that you can get involved with. A lot of women are involved in that area also. You're seeing more women get involved in the, uh, the combat branches too. Uh, those, are, those are just some areas of the average Civil War unit. Uh, there are different ways that you can determine which unit you want to get with. Uh, my personal opinion is you should actually go to a live reenactment or a living history. You should determine whether you want to be involved in a family-oriented group or whether you want to be involved in a group that's primarily <clears throat> individually motivated that is not family-oriented. Uh, some groups uh, like the family orientation because the wives have a broader part of the reenactment to get involved in as camp followers. They prepare the meals. They look after the camp as the combatants uh, go on the field and perform the battle. Uh, sometimes they'll even put on a uniform, uh, even though they have to be uh, very uh, discreet about that and make sure they look like their male counterpart. Uh, there are were instances in the Civil War where there were females in the ranks. Uh, but you want to determine basically whether you want to be a fam in a family-oriented group or in an individual-oriented group more. Most of the individual-oriented groups uh, will generally uh, have uh, a more a stricter camp-style type of environment where well, you might have a tent, you might not have a tent. Uh, uh, to keep you from the elements. Uh, some of your more individual groups are very strict on their uniform customs. Uh, uh, even though in your family-oriented groups you have a very strict uniform code too. But uh, basically uh, there are certain guidelines that every group has. You want to know what those guidelines are when you see these reenactments and when you go through the camps and talk to the groups themselves. Uh, uh, one way to find out uh, what branch or uh, what phase of the Civil War hobby you want to get involved in is to uh, go to, a, as I said, to go to a live reenactment. You can uh, get an idea by looking at TV or going to the movies. You can read periodicals and Civil War journals and magazines. All of these things give you a basic idea what, uh, how you'll get involved in the reenactment hobby. We have a guide that gives you a breakdown of Civil War units and uh, Civil War settlers. Uh, that is a great tool to be able to find out which group in your area uh, would be closest to you. You can check on that group. Uh, we also have a uniform guideline and that can give you some idea from a price standpoint what branch of the Civil War hobby you could really get involved with cost-wise. Uh, in cavalry, of course, you have, you have a horse. You have to take care of the horse. You have a saddle. Uh, you, there's so many things involved in that aspect. In the infantry aspect, you have the basic uniform. You have the musket. You have the up, upkeep of, of that. So there's a certain cost factor there. And uh, in the artillery, you've got a basic uniform and that aspect too. So you want to check the price guide to get a basic idea what your cost outlay would be for the uniform. So uh, that, those are some ways by which you can really find out what branch of the Civil War hobby you want to be involved in. And the main thing, the main thing is to go to a live reenactment and to talk to these people, go through the camps, get a basic impression whether you can communicate with them or not, whether you like the way the unit is functioning in camp and on the battlefield, you want to observe them, and you don't want to make a hasty decision. You want to sit back, write down the pros and cons of each branch of the different units, how they communicate, how they work with each other, and this is a, a learning process too. When you get involved in this hobby, you know that uh, 
it's always going to be a learning process. You're not going to learn it all at one time. And it's, and it's one of those things that you'll always be able to grow in as time goes on. So you want to consider all of these things. I am Dave Whitlock, and this is Ralph Cruz. We're both Civil War reenactors, and we've been in the hobby for a good many years. We do Confederate and Federal impressions. We would like to show you here the basic firearm of the Civil War reenactor, the Springfield and the infield musket. I'd like to show you, in this case, the infield three-band musket. It is very important to get a three-band musket due to the fact that firing in line, you'll need plenty of clearance between the man in front of you and the front part of the barrel. That's why it's imperative to get a three-band musket. We have a leather sling on this infield, plus a nipple protector. The second item that I want to show you is a infield bayonet, a tri tri triangular bayonet. The infield bayonet fit to the front part of the musket. If you want to try to keep this as clean as possible, it will rust on you. A little bit of steel wool will take the rust off. The third item that I want to show you is a Confederate, in this case a Confederate scalpel. It is sewn and it has a lead finial. Uh, the Confederacy did not have the materials as the Federal Army did, so they had to improvise. In this case, they sewed the scabbard together and they used the lead finial. This scabbard will be used to protect the bayonet while it's worn on the side of the soldier. Just put inside this way. Another item that I want to show you is a linen sling. The Confederacy used a lot of linen slings because leather was a short supply. David, what would these items cost a typical reenactor? Typical reenactor, if he had to buy an infield musket, the price would be $395 for the musket and $35 for the bayonet and scabbard. Ralph, would you like to show them the Springfield? Sure, Dave. The probably most common musket among federal troops would be the, again, Springfield rifle percussion musket, 58 caliber, a reproduction of the musket made up in Springfield, Massachusetts. Again, notice it's a, it's a three band, one count for three bands with a leather sling. Um, one point in, in purchasing a musket like this would be uh, Springfield's probably a little bit lighter than the infield is, so that may be one advantage in purchasing of a Springfield musket. Along with that, you'd also have to purchase, a, again, a triangular socket bayonet made for the Springfield. That's important. And along with that, your, your scabbard. Again, this is a leather scabbard, rooted with a, a uh, brass tip on it. The typical price for the musket would probably run you about $450, and again for the scabbard and bayonet, about $35. In this segment, we want to talk about the basic military uniform of northern and southern soldiers, 1861-1865. Now, when a soldier was issued his uniform, he often complained it came in three sizes, too big, too small, and don't fit. And that may be true when you buy your uniform. So what we're giving here is a basic overall generic impression of what the common soldier would have wore. When you buy your uniform, always check your unit regulations or your unit commander to make sure you're buying the, the proper items that fit your unit's impression. Dave? Uh, I'd like to show you, first of all, the hat. Now the hat that Ralph is wearing is a Boma or forage cap, which I have here. This is uh, blue-gray, his is blue. This is a Confederate style, this is a Federal style. Uh, these were both used in the Confederate and the Federal armies. This is a curved bill, he has a square bill on his. These hats generally run roughly around $35. The hat that I'm wearing here is a slouch hat. This is also made out of wool, and this was also used by the Confederate and the Federal Armies. This runs about $45. Another hat that I'd like to show you is a cappy. This is a Confederate cappy, 
Uh, they were also used in the Federal Army, and these will run you roughly about $35 for a kepi. Another item uh, that you want to get is a sack coat. This is a four-button sack. What I'm wearing is a shell jacket with Federal buttons. He is also wearing Federal buttons. The sack coat was worn, as, it, as the name implies, like a sack. It was used in the field when the individual soldier was in combat. The <clears throat> coats that were generally used in the Civil War were your shell jackets, sack coats, and your, <clears throat> your uh, frock coat. Now this item here is a wool shell jacket, a Confederate shell jacket, and you have nine buttons, Virginia buttons on this here. Now your shell jacket is generally going to run you around $65 to $100. Your sack coat is going to run you between $50 and $60. Now Dave, suppose they had one of these custom made for a unit that had a special <clears throat> requirement or something special. What would run me then, you think? A shell jacket is going to run you somewhere custom made around $175 for a shell jacket. You can generally figure on a custom made item running about twice the cost that you would find it on Sutler's Row. You want to make sure, above all else, when you buy your clothes, that they're well made and they're well put together. Uh, the next item that we have here is an optional piece, but it's one that you want to have sooner or later, and this is your vest. This is a military vest with eagle buttons. The Confederacy also had a uh, vest, but they came in blue as well as brown and other colors. And uh, they also use federal and state buttons on their vest, as well as bone and wood. These are cost what, Dave, you think, for a typical vest? For a typical vest, you're talking roughly around $35 for the vest. And it's nice to have those cold, cold, exactly. cold lights. They, they, they're good insulation with your shell jacket or with your sack coat, and they make your impression like 100% better. The next item that we have here Yes, shirts, there's think? a shirt, and in this particular shirt here is classified as a collarless shirt. Uh, the Confederates and the Federals both use typically the same type of shirt. The Confederates, in some cases, are, would have used more shirts coming from home or from homespun material, whereas your Federal soldier might have used shirts that were general issue through the Army. This is a Confederate shirt as well as this particular one right here. Now, your uh, federal shirts also uh, were different colors, but for reenactment's sake, I would start it with either a gray or a white shirt, either In this segment, we're going to talk about accoutrements or accessories worn by both northern and southern soldiers. Again, this is a generic overview of the items they would have wore. Before going out and purchasing these items, please consult your unit guidelines as to what items your unit requires uh, for their impression. Dave? Okay. Uh, what I'd like to show you here is a federal waist belt. The federal waist belt was designed to keep your other accruements in place. It was not designed like the belts that we have today. This belt that I have here has the U.S. oval. It also has the brass keeper that kept the belt in place. This was a very important item to the soldier. It was black leather, not brown as a Confederate soldier might have had. I'm going to give this to Ralph so he can go ahead and put it on with his other accoutrements. As we go through these series, he's going to put the accoutrements on to show you the finished product. Uh, what I'd like to show you here is a Confederate belt. This is a forked tongue belt. It's brass and it's brown leather. The Confederate soldier would have had to have been a little bit more diversified because he did not have the sources to go to as the Federal soldier did. The Confederate soldier got a lot of things from home and from independent makers at that time. So uh, his main concern was just to have equipment in general. And uh, in this particular case, we have a forked tongue brown belt. Rolfing color, russet color belt. Exactly. This is 
similar to the U.S. Orville, except that it has a CS on it, it is a brown belt. And this is typical of what a Confederate soldier would have worn also. There were, as you go through here, you'll see a lot of varieties of Confederate belts, whereas a Federal soldier is really distinctly one belt. This is another variety. This is a Georgia frame buckle, and it's brass, and you have a russet, you have the russet belt along with that. Okay, this item here is a brown roller buckle. The roller buckle and the Georgia frames were very prevalent in the Confederate ranks. Uh, they were durable and they wore indefinitely. They were, they were a very good belt for the soldier, that's why they lasted so long. This is another copy right here of a roller buckle, but it is black leather. And will these belts run, Dave, as far as cost the, would be, you the think? The belts will generally run, I would say, around twelve fifty for the belt and five dollars for the plate. Uh, you want a good quality leather, don't you, too, for exactly. this? Exactly. You want very durable leather. You don't want leather that will crack or will disintegrate within a couple of years of use. Yeah, a good belt should last you how many years, you think? 10, 15 it years? It should at least? last you a very good length of time. Almost a lifetime, I'd say, right. if you take care right. of it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another item we want to discuss are the cap boxes. The federal cap box that I have here is an 1850 style. They are, there is also an 1845 style, but for our purposes and what the reenact will buy, in this case is an 1850 style. It's got the brass finial and it was used to keep the caps for the musket to put on the nipple of the musket. And this particular model here has two leaps two loops, which was typical of what the federal soldier would have had uh, on this particular box. I'm going to give that to Ralph also. This type, this type right here is a Confederate type. And uh, you can see, you can see the uh, inside here. It is a single loop. It has got a lead finial. And this is classified as a shield type. And the Confederacy, unlike the Federal Army, would have used different styles from different makers, and as the war progressed, they would have used different materials. Uh, they, would have, they might have even, even used a canvas front. As the war progressed, they would have just had sides made out of leather. But this is a shield type here. Another variety here uh, is it's a two-loop brass finial shield type. You can see these are two shield types, but they're a little bit different. And what is one as far as cost would be, Dave? Mm -hmm. The cap boxes are going to run about twelve fifty. It really depends, as I said, whether you get one off a of Sutler's Raw or custom made. You can generally spend, uh, spend twice the amount for a custom made box, but they're going to run you about twelve fifty for those. This example here is an infield single loop in the back. This was imported from England. There were a lot of imports from England uh, on leather goods, especially cab boxes and cartridge boxes. And this is an example of a cab box that came from England. The uh, next item that I want to show you are the cartridge boxes. I'll first start off with a federal cartridge box. This cartridge box has a U.S. plate on it. And it has a cross strap with an eagle. Now, this is a 69 pattern, which has a large face to it. The russet box that I have here is a 55 pattern. You see how small the 55 pattern as compared to the 69 pattern. The federal box has a U.S. plate, the eagle, and you have the cross strap. I'll give this to Ralph. Now, this box, as well as the Confederate boxes, we used to carry the cartridges in. You want to make sure when you buy the box, you get one that is well constructed and is well made and is documented. Uh, I showed you the russet box. This is a Confederate 55 russet box. It is smaller. It was designed for the 55 musket, but it gives you a good comparison to go by. Another example 
There's a, this is a 69 box with a cross strap. You'll notice on the Confederate box there's no plate on the box itself by the cross strap. Early in the war, your Confederate forces did have plates on the box itself and the cross strap, but as the war progressed, they were deleted, and uh, what I would recommend would be no plate for the box or the cross strap. You just really don't need it. Another item here is an infield box. You can use this with your infield cap patch. This was imported from England, and it's a little bit smaller. It was designed after uh, the English leather goods that were in the English Army. And these boxes here are going to run you around $42, depending on the style that you want. Okay, the next item that we have here are the canteens. I want to show you, in this case, a bullseye with a leather strap. The canteens in general came with cotton straps. As time went on, the soldier would have used a leather strap for durability. <clears throat> the canteen that I have here, as I said, is a bullseye. It came in between 1862 and 1864. The smooth side, which was in 1858, was an early model, but they, they, they went ahead and improvised, and by putting ridges in the side of the canteen, were able to make the canteen a little bit stronger. So this was a, this was a canteen generally used by federal forces, but Confederate troops also used them when they could get their hands on them. This is an example right here of a smooth side with a gray cover. This is a blue cover. And uh, you also had brown covers. Another example of a canteen is a wooden canteen. This was primarily used by Confederate forces. Some conf Confederates used them all through the war. But uh, they, uh, they were very good up to a certain point when they would start to wear out. The wood would, would begin to crack. The tin, which these canteens were made out of, were very durable, and therefore they would much rather use the metal canteens than the wooden canteens. And what does canteens run, Davis? The price canteens price are going to run somewhere around $25 to $70. The wooden one, in this case, is $70, and the stainless steel ones are going to run around $65. This is a stainless steel canteen I have here, and these tin canteens here run about what, you think? About $35. $35. Now, one thing you have to consider, prices will vary. And the prices are going up all the time. So you want to make sure you get something that is accurate, that is well made, and that will last a long time. Now the next item that I have here are the haversacks. Now <clears throat> I'll start off with the federal haversack. This federal haversack here was an early haversack. It was stitched. It has a roller buckle, and I'll give this to Ralph. It also had an inner patch, and this was used for the soldier to carry his eating utensils, his food, things that he really wanted to keep close to him. Uh, this particular haversack here is riveted. This came along later in the war. It's a little bit bigger. They did vary in size. Some federal soldiers did have regular linen and cotton haversacks, but for the most part, most soldiers north and south wanted a tarred haversack to keep out the elements. This right here is another style haversack. This is strictly a cotton haversack that was, that was used by the Confederate soldier. It has no inner pouch, even though some of them did, but in some cases that's really all that the Confederate soldier could get in the South. So this is just another example of the haversack. Your haversacks are going to vary in price from $25 on up to $35. So what you have now is, is the, the final the final look. And one thing we want to point out, out is when you wear your gear, a common mistake most reenactors will make is wearing that gear down low uh, around around the down their hips. You want to wear it up on your hips for a correct look. You want that, that coverage box up high. Your waist belt is what it means. It's, it's up on your waist here, up high on your hips. Your canteen, you tend to wear, wear that high. It flops around less and it feels better. Again, you have a sack up high too. So what you have here is basically a soldier with his, his accoutrements on, um, ready for the field. Right. And your Confederate soldier would not have necessarily had the breastplate as you see here. Uh, 
and you wouldn't have had the plate on the side of the cartridge box. In this segment, we're talking about the items that you'll need as accessories. There's some items you'll definitely need, others you can buy later as you get more involved in the reenactment hobby. The first item that I want to introduce here is a blanket. This is a great blanket. It was used by both federal and confederate forces. You can either get a gray blanket or a tan blanket like this. Or even, even a dark blue blanket would be ideal, wouldn't dark it? Dark blue blanket would be fine. And uh, you want to get one that's durable, and you want to get one that uh, you can use up uh, on campaign after campaign. I would recommend that you get two blankets. The second item that you want to get is the poncho. The poncho, in this case, is rubberized. And you've got a slit. You've got a slit in the middle that allows you to go ahead and put your head through use Ralph as an example here, in case you want to keep the rain off of you when you're doing your campaigning uh, in a reenactment. Now, the poncho is going to run you about $38. The blanket is going to run you about $35. The third item you want to buy is the ground cloth. Ground cloth is very good. It keeps the elements off your equipment and it also shields you from the elements too. These were, also, these were used by the Confederate and Federal forces. Uh, the Confederacy tried to adopt a rubberized gun blanket. They were not that successful. Whenever they could get their hands on one, they did so. So they're very important to have. Another item that we show here is a shelter half. Now this is a custom-made shelter half. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive than one you can buy on Settlers Row. And they'll run about $35, won't they, Ralph? Around that, I would say, yes. Uh, they have buttons in the middle here where you can attach it to another shelter half with a buddy and use as a dog tent. It's a very nice item to have when you do your first person impression to show the general public. So you want to get one of these. This is not a necessity, but it's one you want to consider getting at a later date. Now, don't brass units often supply tents for you too, Dave, or not? Yes, that's exactly right. A lot of units will supply their own tents for the reenactors. You want to check first with the group that you're with to make sure that they have tents available. But I would recommend one of these whenever you get a chance to buy one. Another item that you want to buy is a knapsack. This is a double bag knapsack. This was a federal issue knapsack worn by both Confederate and Federal units. This is tarred. This is a very nice item to have to do your first person impression. Another item is a single bag, which was an early style Federal knapsack. This was primarily a Western Theater type of knapsack. You want to use one of these or either the double bag. They're very nice to have, but you do not need them at first. You can simply take a blanket Wrap it around a poncho, put it over your shoulder, and that is your temporary knapsack until you can buy one of these. Now, Ralph has a few other items he's going to go over with you, and I'll let Ralph take off from here. Uh, a couple of items I consider necessities out in the field. Uh, one you're going to have to have uh, will be a, a good quality tin cup. Um, soldiers use tin out in the field. Don't go out and buy one of these um, enamel cups. You want a good quality tin cup that's thick, not cheaply made. Uh, in this case, we have two sizes of, of tin cups up here. This is like a boiler, ideal for you take this and boil your coffee in the morning, uh, maybe bo uh, cook your beans, cook your rice in. Um, ideal to have, it makes a cup also, and, and it hangs from your equipment very nicely. We recommend one of these three items very strongly. Another item you probably see out in the field would be a, a small um, uh, cooking pan, frying pan, ideal for you cooking your bacon in the morning, hard tack, cooking up your beans or whatever, okay? Um, one of these right here. These tin cups are probably a good quality one. It'll probably cost you $10 and up. 
A frying pan you can probably pick up for seven or eight dollars, what you say. That's right, yeah. Good price on those. The boiler's gonna cost you twenty-five. Twenty-five. And you can't get them in stainless steel also, um, so they'll 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 stay keep uh, uh, a little bit longer. Wear better. Another item you're gonna need out in the field for sure will be some sort of, of silverware. In this case, uh, these usually have bone handles on them, and or you can find one that's either uh, a um, uh, sterling silver or a, a plated type of silver type of spoon. Um, these will probably run in the neighborhood of probably eight dollars a piece, wouldn't you say? Eight or nine dollars for the pair, for the for the set. For the set, yes. But it'll vary from, vary from seller to seller depending on who you buy them from. Okay, but that's important to look at. You also need some sort of a tin plate to eat out of also, be nice to have. Um, you can use a, a wooden bowl if you're a confederate, or many times if you have an old canteen, you can break it into and use half the, half the canteen as a plate. Um, other items you might want to purchase as you develop into the hobby. Uh, one thing I strongly recommend is to buy a, a housewife. Has it has buttons, thread, and needles for sewing up your uh, uniform, uh, uh, tears or swing back on buttons on your uniform, very nice to have out in the field. Uh, personal items might be a, a straight razor out in the field to shave with, or uh, possibly a toothbrush out in the field, um, nice to have. Um, other items you may want to see out in the field might be a, a, a tin, tin type of some sort, uh, maybe a loved one back home, a daughter, your wife, um, uh, or a family member to take with you out in the field. Um, other items to pass the time with out in the field, you might want to buy a, uh, a good deck of cards, a little game of, 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 of poker, i.e. throwing the sheets out in the field. In this case, I have uh, another item might be a um, domino set. This is made out of bone. Musical wise, you might want to buy a little jaw harp, or if you play the harmonica or some musical instrument, ideal to have to add to your impression. Other items might include a um, little, little pocket Bible here. It's the New Testament, uh, put up by the New York um, Bible Society. Ideal, a very important part of a soldier's impression, especially in the 18, 1860s. Um, other items might be a, a, a little pocket knife. This is this is again like a little pearl handle kind of bone type for whittling with. A uh, very important item. Most soldiers uh, back then liked their tobacco, so three items might have here. Might be a twist of tobacco if you can pick that up. Uh, a pipe of some sort. This is a Confederate pipe with a clay bowl on it. Um, match is called Lucifer's. This is a little match safe you might want to pick up sometime. Open, open this up and you keep your matches in there. A very nice item to have. Um, you've seen the impression generally from top to bottom. The one important part that, that you don't hear or see very much of is often eyewear. If you're, if you're nearsighted or farsighted, and, and Dave and I are, are, happen to be both that way, um, we both wear period glasses out in the field. In this case, these, these are, are oval frame, and Dave has the same sort of thing or possibly a, what they call a coffin type frame. Um, these are very fragile. You can buy these probably from a settler or maybe a, a antique shop for about $20, $25 for the, for the frame. Check the frame out, get a good quality frame. And you can have lenses put into them for around, what you say, about $25 a day? Total cost can run you about $60. $60, but ideal for out in the field. They're, they're very nice to have. I prefer them over contacts because when you're out in the field, you're, you're generally, you can't wash or or keep your hands clean, it's hard to get a contact in and out of your eye. Right. So these are very, very nice to have. Right. And to just go over the essentials that you'll need, you'll need the blanket, I'd recommend two. You'll need the poncho and the ground cloth. You'll need your eating utensils, plate, and cup. Those, those are some things that you'll need. And then, uh, you know, you should be able to enjoy your hobby a little bit more uh, as a result. Again, always consult your unit guidelines before buying any of these items to make sure that they're unit approved. Right. And as you develop your impression, then you can you can pick up other items. Right. And make sure an experienced reenactor goes with you on Settlers Row to show you really what the best thing to buy is.
there are certain safety considerations that you want to keep in mind as you get involved in the Civil War hobby. I'm going to touch on two basic uh, safety items. One stresses the equipment aspect, the other is the physical aspect. First, I'll discuss the equipment. Your equipment is basically made up of a Civil War musket and a bayonet. You want to make sure when you go into a Civil War battle or a living history that your musket has been properly cleaned and maintained. By doing this, it will reduce the amount of fouling that you have at a reenactment. You, want to, you also want to make sure that your bayonet is properly secured in a scabbard that it is properly clean and is kept at your side. You want to make sure that when you fire your musket, you want to have the musket over the right shoulder of the person in front of you and you have enough clearance between the front of the barrel and his face. You do not want to use a two-band musket at a reenactment. You primarily want to use a three-band musket. That is very important. Uh, because of the amount of clearance that you have with a two-band and a three-band musket. You also want to make sure that the ramrod is in the channel of the musket and that it is not down in the barrel of the musket. Uh, there are a lot of occasions where a reenactor will get so engrossed in the battle that he could forget that he has just rammed down a cartridge in the barrel and he leaves the ramrod in the barrel. You want to make sure you either leave the ramrod in the channel of the musket or you leave it back at camp in your tent. You want to make sure when you shoot the musket that if you have an opponent uh, or a soldier in front of you that's a close proximity that the musket is elevated and that uh, it, you have enough clearance between your line and the enemy's line. You want to make sure that if he is within 25 or 30 yards that you do not shoot right into his face. A Civil War musket is a, is a weapon. It's a black powder uh, weapon and it can be very dangerous. Uh, accidents can happen in the heat of a battle and you want to make sure that you use proper safety procedures. You want to listen to your commander by what he says and you want to make sure you follow his commands uh, very precisely in this case because it could mean a person getting hurt in a Civil War reenactment. You also want to observe the physical aspect of the reenactment. You want to make sure you have proper clothing, proper footwear. You want to make sure you have a poncho because you'll be doing these reenactments in cold weather, hot weather, rainy weather, snowy weather, all different types of weather reenactments are very rarely have a castle due to weather and you'll be expected to go ahead and perform accordingly under these conditions. You want to make sure you have a hat so that you can keep off the rain and the heat. You want to make sure you have uh, a proper change of clothing and socks, pants and shirt to make sure uh, you're not wet all weekend and catch a cold. Uh, you also want to make sure that uh, you do not succumb to the heat. You want to make sure if you do feel sick that you get with your commander. I know in a lot of cases when we have reenactments in the summer, uh, soldiers are very vulnerable to the heat. So you want to make sure you take care of the, the uh, water aspect. You want to make sure you drink a lot of water. And if you do have a problem, sit down, uh, go up under a tree, uh, Get in touch with your commanding officer. Just let him know how you're feeling. Those are very important aspects of uh, the safety aspect of the, of the hobby. You want to make sure your musket is clean, your, your bayonet uh, is properly maintained and on your side, your ramrod is in the channel that you shoot properly when engaging the enemy, and you have the proper attire on when you do a reenactment so you don't catch cold or uh, succumb to the heat.